This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week we have Dale Doherty of Maker Fame and so much more. Aaron Newcomb is going to be helping me with this, and it is going to be a great show that's coming up next. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 630, recorded Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. The State of Making. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Udacity. Gain in-demand tech skills in as little as three months with Udacity's part-time online tech courses. Visit udacity.com slash twit and get 75% off any program with code twit75. Offer ends June 30th, 2021. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or try it for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Greetings, everybody, everywhere. You happen to be in the world of space and time. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. And I'm joined this week by the great Aaron Newcomb in his lair. <laughs> I don't know about is. the great. I also don't know about space and time. Can I can I join from yesterday? Is that possible if I join the podcast? Does you that work? No, it doesn't work. This is, you know, this is a little like, um, you know, I like got on Facebook, which I hate to admit I actually use. I, I got it. I, I get invited not only by the dead, you know, to be friends with them, uh, but also uh, by myself, which makes me, made me ask, <laughs> is one of us dead? And then several people wrote, see, is Doc dead? You know, is he horrible? I mean, is it there? <laughs> so so there, it is weird. It can be weird. So so you're you're in in your old hood. You're in the in the North Bay someplace, I assume. Yes, yes, I am. And I've got my, uh, since we're using Zoom today, I've got my Zoom background on so you can see the the front facing <laughs> view, which normally you can't see. You see my mess behind me with all my projects on the floor yeah. in, in various uh, states of uh, completeness. So, so yeah. So, and, and are they a, uh, all, all of our guests are special, but we have like an extra special guest uh, this week who's right up your, your alley, Dale Doherty of making and many other things fame uh and uh which which is your your bailiwick so i'm yeah I'm expecting you to yeah do for sure <laughs> uh, yeah we'll talk we'll talk about it but i you know my uh, you know make magazine really inspired me to you know found my own maker space start my own maker fair or not my own maker fair it's for everybody but but you know we started a maker fair here uh, in town and that's, uh, st- still going in, in various stages. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been, a, a, a real, uh, a roller coaster ride really since make magazine, since I first learned about make magazine and started getting invested in the maker movement. So I have a huge debt of thanks to Dale, uh, in terms of bringing this to, uh, fruition in part, along with lots of other folks. I just love that. Um, that uh, when when Dale was and okay, he could correct me on this, but when he was still with O'Reilly, um, which you know, and, and Tim told me we're never going to make a magazine, <laughs> and then he got him to start <laughs> Make Magazine, you know, because I I thought, hey, why don't you why don't you buy Linux Journal, right? And I think Make Magazine was a much better investment than that would have been. Anyway, we need to get get going on the show. We get off to a late start, thanks to my uh, technical glitches. So. But first, I have to let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Udacity. Are you looking to take your tech skills to the next level? Udacity is the world's fastest, most efficient way to master the skills top employers are looking for. Udacity offers a unique part-time online educational program designed to bridge the gap between learning and your career goals. As part of their nano degree programs, you can put in just five to 10 hours a week for as little as three months to learn a suite of employable skills. To create the course content, Udacity partners with industry leaders such as Microsoft, Google, 
IBM, and AWS so you learn the in-demand skills needed in today's tough job market. Once you enroll as a student in a specific course offering, you'll be prompted to view the online course as well as complete a series of projects and support courses designed to help you develop job-relevant skills. You can work at your own pace any time of the day or night. Udacity helps you build a portfolio on GitHub and LinkedIn to show prospective employers. Learn to network, get noticed, and land the job you want. So what are the most sought after Udacity nano degrees for consumers and business clients alike? Some of the top 10 are data engineering, data analyst, product manager, C++, and digital marketing. You can build skills through industry-leading programs designed and recognized by top companies worldwide. Over 14 million people in over 240 countries now use Udacity. They have incredible programs for you to choose from that fit the tech niche you're looking for. AI, cloud computing, data science, autonomous systems, programming, and more. Best of all, you can improve your earning potential, get real employable skills through project-based active learning that covers cutting edge technology. Projects are reviewed by qualified professionals. You have real human help and personalized code reviews with access to mentors 24 seven. They offer flexible payment options and you can learn at your own pace and schedule. Udacity also has free courses. Francisco Gutierrez found that a four year degree was too expensive. He participated in the Grow with Google Udacity Challenge and was awarded a full scholarship for the Mobile Web Specialist Nano Degree. After going through the program, he received an internship from Microsoft who offered him a full-time role as a software engineer. This was all possible because of Udacity. Technology is disrupting enterprises across every industry. With Udacity for Enterprise, you can upskill your workforce. Be sure to check out their website today. Get the in-demand skills you need to advance your career. Visit udacity.com slash twit and get 75% off any program with code twit 75. This offer ends June 30th, 2021. That's udacity.com slash twit and enter twit 75. Okay. Welcome, uh, Dale Doherty. I mean, he is, I'm just going to run down the, the, the bio here. Um, chairman of the maker, a uh, champion really of the maker movement. And he founded Make Magazine in 2005, which first used the term makers to describe people who enjoyed hands-on work and play, started Maker Fair in the San Francisco Bay Area in 2006, spread to nearly 200 locations in 40 countries with over one and a half million attendees annually. He's president of the Make Community, which produces Make and Maker Fair. He's the author of Free to Make, How the Maker Movement is Changing Our Jobs, Schools, and Minds with Adrian uh, Conrad. He believes the maker movement has the potential to transform the educational experience of students and introduce them to the practice of innovation through play and tinkering. And he has a podcast as well uh, called The Make Has. Welcome, Dale. It is an extraordinary mm. privilege to have you on the show. Yeah, There he is. Uh, doc, there you are. Hi, Doc. It's really <laughs> nice to see you and Aaron. And a uh, pleasure to be with you today. It, it, it is it is great. I uh I, I, not in the, the the wonderful bio you you gave me. You actually had like the first graphical website, wasn't it? I mean, I, I don't. I'm sure the uh, web. You, web, you also yeah. created the term Web 2.0. I mean, yeah. the web wouldn't be the same without you. It's not yeah. just the well, maker. Thank movement. you. I don't know, but you know, uh, in uh, you know the early '90s, uh, I you know learned about the the World Wide Web and you know connected with Tim Berners Lee and thought there's something special here that anybody could put pages on the internet and other people can find them. And so uh, in 92, we launched, uh, you know, some some version of this and based on the O'Reilly book called uh, Whole Internet Catalog. And, and it became uh, a GNN, uh, uh, which was launched in 93. And uh, really, uh, that's what excited me is, hey, we could actually not just do text, like in, in some of the old tools that were available there, but we could we could put images and it seemed like an environment which you could publish information and uh, all kinds of information. And uh, that, that set me off uh, down that road. 
that may be one of the first sites I looked at, maybe even the first site I did with Mosaic. Um, yeah. Which I think yeah. came along in 94. There was links before that. That's, it's um, actually 93. Um, 93. I had, huh. yeah, it, it, in the, the first one, the X Windows version of it, it was 1993, the spring of 93. We had a, I had, because you know, I was launching this GNN, I had a worldwide web wizards workshop in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And <laughs> and we had <laughs> had 30 people, which was pretty much everybody, including the Mosaic <laughs> team, that was working on either web browsers or web backend servers. And, uh, you know, it was the first time they all got together and talked through things. And, uh, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, Mark Andreessen, um, and, and uh, you know, but... That's how small it was back in 93. Yes, yeah, so, so that was probably the first summit, right? Yeah. It wasn't a very I mean, tall really hill at the, at the time, but that yeah. was a, that was a, <laughs> yeah. a, a kind of summit. I wanted to, are there photos from that? Are there, is there, is there you know, I haven't seen it, but there were probably a few, yeah, there's probably a record somewhere. Uh, I haven't kept it, but uh, some of those so, things So survived. when was the, was there a moment when you, um, either went to Tim or went to yourself or somewhere and said, hey, we have to do a magazine and we're going to call it Make. Um, yeah, there, there was yeah. actually a moment uh, <laughs> and, and it kind of fits into this story. Uh, uh, Tim and I shared a cab uh, in Portland uh, uh, going to the open source uh, convention. And uh, I was just talking to him and I say, Tim, I have an idea for a magazine. It's kind of Martha Stewart for geeks. And uh, and and that was the pitch to him. He said, "That sounds interesting. Go ahead. You know, just explore it." Tim has always been pretty supportive, and uh, just uh, uh, that that's that's all it was. I had been doing a series of books that uh, at O'Reilly called Hacks, and uh, you know, most technology books and most technology articles are about companies producing things. And what interested me in, in this hack series was how people were oh, given a, an API to the Google search engine, what kind of applications they were building on top of that. Things that just reflected their own interests. Uh, it had not necessarily any idea that it was commercial. It was just something cool and fun to do. So I started doing books like Google Hacks and 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 others. And, and that kind of put me to – we – I remember uh, – R Rafi Kakorian uh, did a, a, a book with me on on the TiVo and TiVo hacks, and and I kind of saw that oh, just like we we're hacking software, we're going to hack hardware, and that that kind of was the moment that inspired me to think about well, gee, that that's going to be broader than just a book. How how could we do this? And that's why I thought I, well, in a magazine, I can cover all kinds of ways that people are. Uh, working with hardware and software to, to create new applications. That's, it, that's really interesting that uh, I'd actually half forgotten about the hacks thing. There was not, I mean, if, if you look back on the way, actually the whole hacker movement, the whole geek movement happened going back to the 60s and 70s even, is that everybody who was programming seriously was doing it in a corporate environment. And and in respect to O'Reilly books and your and your books, um, you would go into into the engineering corner of any large company, and every uh, this is in the in the era when when all hives were were equipped by Herman Miller in cubicles, and every cubicle had a shelf, and on that shelf were O'Reilly books. And yeah. but what happened, I think, and your your insight, I think, actually both with with and with with Make Magazine is. Let's work for the for the individuals. Let's work for the geeks here. Let's give them something. And it also recognized that, and it's actually something Mark Andreessen said. It's actually haunted my mind ever since he said it. It was in an interview journal when he when he and Netscape were open sourcing what was then the Netscape Navigator and became Mozilla, um, which is all technology trends start with technologists and. And that's, of course, it's, it's like, a, it's almost a tautology. It's an obvious thing. A technology starts with technologists, but it actually starts with some geek who has a, a an itch to scratch or just a, you know, a muse to follow or yep. some hack to do, whether it's on a TiVo or something yeah. else. Yeah. And, and 
that's exactly right. And I, I think that scratch your own itch, Eric Raymond's famous line was just what I was following and, and looking for people doing this. And I think the other component that, you know, I mapped into, you know, it was my familiarity with open source is that sort of that itch gets expressed as a project. And a project is not a company. It's not a product. It's its own thing. It has its own life cycle, if you will. So, you know, when I got into Make, it was sort of about people and projects. Uh, that's what I wanted. And and I wanted to, because this was not just, hey, download this code and run it. It was, you. it required a build. And so I wanted to share the details of that build. That was my version of open source uh, physical things that you, you know, the more people could see the instructions of how something was built, the more they could learn from those instructions to build something of their own. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it, it's interesting to me. I mean, I I want to I want to know when it, when exactly did you start Make Magazine? I mean, I this I I I just pulled this off a shelf. This is Volume Six. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Here in my office. Yeah. But so it, what, what here's was volumes. The, here's Volume Seventy Seven. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so we've 70. come a ways. But what what, uh, what year was that though? Yeah, uh, we, started we started in two thousand. Five. It was the first publication, you okay. know, February 2005, we published it, but we started working on it in 2003 and four. Uh, Mark Fraunfelder was the first editor uh, of oh, wow. Make. Yeah. And we had a small team uh, that put it together. And, uh, you know, I, I remember some advice was uh, if you start a magazine, make sure you have enough content for, <laughs> you know, your next issue and your next issue and your next issue that, you know, some ideas run out of Thing. And that's what led me is that, well, there's, you know, everywhere I turn and talk to people, I'm finding new projects and, and new people with projects. So it, it seems, and I'd say that's still true today. It's an almost inexhaustible, inexhaustible number of projects uh, that are out there. And then you take an editor like Mark, who's looking for things that were cool and fun and, and maybe hadn't been covered widely. And so I think we, well, in some ways, we were a technology magazine. We decided early on that, like Popular Mechanics, we wanted to follow what people were doing, uh, even if it didn't have a microcontroller in it or uh, wasn't about uh, a machine. So, you know, we, we might have covered, you know, kombucha recipes and things like that. But it was had this strong DIY flavor. And that and that and that's really about sharing sharing uh, how to do something. And and I think the magazine and a lot of what we've done is about passing on know-how, which is practical knowledge, which is, you know, the procedure or process for doing something, not just the theoretical or conceptual grounding of it. One of the things that uh, I've always thought interesting, because there, there is a great deal of comparison made. I certainly make it when I ex try to explain the maker movement. There is a, a good deal of comparison between some of those old magazines, Popular Mechanics, Popular Electronics, uh, yeah. Byte Magazine, for example, which I have a, a whole library of these just to go back and, and read the history. You can't see it because of my uh, background there. But, um, yeah. you it's know, there is a lot magazine. of comparison. One of the things that I think is different, though, in what they were doing and uh, uh, what Make does is the element of creativity. Do you agree with that? It seems like there's more creativity uh, like that's the element that's added, it seems yeah. like, to the maker movement yeah. when you compare it to what people were doing back in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I mean, you know, especially a magazine like Byte and you recall this kind of some of its famous covers. It was introducing the Mac or introducing new technology. But, you know, what what I found, go back to almost Doc's quote about technologist, it, you know, it's, you know, the, there is a way that the technology industry just generates technology <laughs> and it's not always clear what people will do with it. You know, the early days of the personal computer, there was a debate of whether computers ever belonged in the home uh, or would ever make it into the home. And, and would people ever find a use for them? But, you know, they, they couldn't think of them. And then, you know, to some degree, Apple came along and, and I believe they transformed it into a creative tool. You know, that you could do uh, newsletters and designs and create, you know, visually on it. And that meant it wasn't just a, um, you know, a number crunching machine. And so I think that uh, your insight, Aaron, is a good one. We always 
come at it from a creative side. Uh, and ideally, there's this intersection of creative um, ideas and and technical knowledge uh, that uh, you know that we see at things like Maker Fair and stuff. That's what I get excited about. Um, you know, currently there's a, well, obviously we're in the, the midst of COVID and I wanted to talk a little bit about that in terms of the effect that it's had on maker spaces in particular, because that's kind of what I'm interested in, but you know, the maker movement in general, have you heard, uh, from people as you talk to people, uh, you know, how, how COVID has been affecting efforts that are going on, whether it's either personal, you know, endeavors or maker spaces yeah. and things like that? Yeah. Well, I, I think it, it's it's had both negative and positive effects. Uh, on the negative side, um, maker spaces in libraries and schools are closed because those you know, um, institutions are closed. Uh, and, and community maker spaces uh, have had periods of, of closure. Um, some have have begun to open up, um, but it's it's a few vulnerable spaces have closed entirely. So it has been a hit, but I think what we also saw during COVID-19 was actually the realization of what the maker movement is about. Uh, people began to realize that their hospitals and medical professionals lacked personal protective equipment and the supply chain and the uh, distribution systems for that were gummed up or broken. And so there weren't um, really good sources for masks, face shields, and, and other devices. Uh, and the maker movement in some ways technically was, I think, based on this idea that I credit Neil Gershenfeld of the Fab Labs with, which is, you know, a digital design can go anywhere in the world and you can have equipment locally to produce the thing using that design. So that's exactly what happened during uh, – COVID-19. I, I did a program in, in writing about it called Plan C, which is uh, I called a civic response to uh, COVID. You know, that plan A might be, well, the government will figure this all out for us. And that wasn't happening. Uh, uh, plan B might be industry fills that gap and, and steps up. And it didn't see that they were figuring that out either. So Plan C is, is uh, really a, a self-organizing civic network um, happening widely distributed, but very local. People were making stuff and taking it to the hospital. And if the hospital refused, they contacted doctors who said, yeah, give it to me, bring it to my home and I'll take it in. And yep. so that, that you know, I, I hope we don't lose sight of what happened uh, in these maker spaces during COVID-19, because I think it is a really important lesson uh, as a country that, and, and really as a world, we should understand that we have these systems that could be used flexibly. And, and here we have people that, again, like you, Aaron, you know, have been involved in the maker movement, set up maker spaces, learned to use the tools. And all of a sudden there was this crying need to do this thing and they stepped up. You know, they they figured out what they needed to do. And even if they didn't have the medical expertise, they 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 figured out how to uh, how to apply the, their own knowledge and work with people who had that expertise. And and I think it's just a we, we need some kind of uh, distributed, flexible, localized uh, uh, system for for creating things, particularly, you know, in, in uh, times of emergency. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, um, uh, positive outcome, definitely. And we would definitely saw it here in the community that I live in, Benicia. We made, you know, there was a group of us. It wasn't just one person either, right? This was, it wasn't just me at the makerspace. It was other folks around town. We, we made hundreds of thousands of, of fabric masks, fabric masks. Uh, ear savers for doctors, those went like yep. crazy because it was yeah. really hurting. There is, it was something really easy that you could print. Anybody could print yeah. those on a on a cheap 3D printer, right? Exactly. Um, and that's the big difference. We talk a lot about, we talked a lot about uh, comparisons between uh, COVID and World War II in the group that I was in. But the difference there was, to me anyway, is that when, in World War II, you had uh, like metal drives, right? But you couldn't make the parts, 
But in the yeah. world we live in now with the maker movement, you could actually make the things, right? You didn't right. have to just go collect the resources. You could actually right. make them. I thought it was really fascinating yeah. uh, to see the community come together in that way. And I, you know, I have to say, if it's not obvious, I'm just really proud that the community was able to contribute this way and that people worked so cooperatively, often with no funding. Um, you know, they were making these things and donating them. Uh, meanwhile, you'd see billions of dollars running out to some, you know, other company or whatever to to do similar things, and they were failing at that. So, you know, I, I just wish that you know our country and others would sort of get their act together and figure out how to support the maker movement because uh, it really um, it, it really did something that uh, you know I had a doctor write me that. Uh, you know, he said for, for four to six weeks, the maker movement, you know, made sure our our medical system was working in our community, that we could, you know, uh, serve the needs of patients. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And uh, so I don't want it to just go away quietly. I think it deserves attention. Yeah, yeah, agreed, uh, 100%. You know, one of the things that struck me as we're sitting here is that, uh, you know, it's the end of May, nearly the end of May. And at least here in the Bay Area, that's when folks would be getting all their stuff together, uh, as a maker at least, bringing stuff down to San Mateo to have in the big Bay Area maker fair. Yeah. And I'm sure other people are, are looking at their calendars, you know, and you know, as Google pictures come up, it's like, oh, what was I doing this time last year or the year before? Oh, you were yeah. going to maker fair. So yeah. um, it's a little bit, little bit sad, but I'm just kind of curious uh, what the status is, the current status of maker fair right now. Yeah. Well, it's great. I mean, I think we're all Sad. Also, trying to figure it out. We haven't had Maker Fair last year, or or won't have one this year in in San Mateo or in the Bay Area. We have some smaller ones that are starting to come back, but, um, you know, I, I think it's a real challenge. I have to uh, sort of figure it out and see if we can find a way to do it next year. Um, I'd love to hear from people that are interested in you know they're helping or uh, I, I think it, we have to reinvent it. I think uh, it may have it grew into something that was quite amazing, but also very costly and very complex. And I think we maybe have to step back and go back to its roots and and try to make it uh, and see if we can bring it back that way. You know, like I said in the intro, though, you know what attracted me about Maker Fair it was still kind of a community, finding people in a community with projects and allowing them to just stand at a table and talk to people. And by that, through that method, you helped inspire other people to get involved and to learn, and particular kids. And and I, I think, you know, some people might say, maybe we don't need Maker Faire anymore. Um, but I kind of say, think about those kids that never had a Maker Faire, because I know how much it mattered to those kids that went to Maker Faire. And, and I mm -hmm. see their work. I see the connections that they made. Uh, in, in what, uh, how they got involved in, say, robotics or, or something else. And so that, that's why I want to see it continue. Um, I'm, I'm pretty open to it. Uh, you know, there's a, I think that personally, there was always a, a, it was a very stressful time because we never knew, you know, how many tickets we'd sell or, you know, if we'd get enough sponsors and you kind of had to just set out to do it and see how it, it, it all uh, came together. And, you know, it, it almost always did come together, but uh, the the risk, you know, in a sense over time grew, grew and grew. Um, and and so we, 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 the pandemic's a kind of a blessing in a way to give us time to think about it and, and, uh, and see if there are enough people that care to that want to get involved again. Um, and, uh, you know, we certainly continue to see it in other countries, like um, our largest maker fair, the last couple of years has been in Rome, um, and uh, so uh, you know I, I think uh, we, we have to you know maker fair was done without any government support, without any foundation support or nonprofit backing, you know it was, it was really done just on ticket sales and sponsors, and um, that 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 was hard. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm curious. Um, and uh, I don't mean I don't mean any offense by this question, yeah, which is sure. always like a <laughs> a Go giveaway. But um, 
did the focus shift? It sounds like from what you, when you first started out, you said you talked about getting back to its roots. I'm just kind of curious, did the engine get so big at some point, especially with the Bay Area Maker Fair being so big, did the, was there focus creep? Did the focus shift uh, towards more of the commercial side of things? And, and did that detract from, uh, you know, the, the core of, of, the, of the program when it first got started? Yeah, it's a good question. It's hard to know. I mean, we, we'd get two kinds of comments. One is in, in some years, people would say, oh, Maker Faire's gone too commercial. There's too many mm-hmm. sponsors there. But I'd also... <laughs> I'd also get comments like, well, where are the sponsors? You know, I, you know, this company's missing. You know, I, I, I want to see what they're doing. So I thought we blended it pretty well. I, I don't think that was, you know, what, what we sort of got caught up into is the, the number of people who wanted to come. Uh, uh, you know, as you get into the tens of thousands of people, you have to spread them out over a bigger area. Um, you need, you know, the number of makers that wanted to participate you know, in the early days, it was doubling each year. And then, you know, it grew uh, uh, more incrementally after that. But still, you'd had thousands of makers with really pretty good exhibits that that wanted to show up. So we were trying to knit all that together. Um, I do think the the truth is that the sponsors, ha- you know, towards the end have had kind of trailed off. We, we were mm-hmm. – uh, it was less a thing that they wanted to be part of and saw it as a unique opportunity. So um, that, that's something that has changed and we'd have to uh, think about that. But I'm, I, I hope they might still care for other reasons, perhaps, than, you know, than just selling what they had or, or offering that. But, you know, out of the heart, and I think I preserve this, but, you know, it's anyone's opinion. You know, I did not want it to be a selling show, an expo. I really wanted it to be an experience where you got to talk to these makers and ask them questions about what they were doing and how they did it and where they found the materials and blah, 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 and how you could, you know, learn from them. And and I think we 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 kept that conversation to be core of Maker Faire. Uh, and it just you know, but it had other wonderful elements of like spectacle and, you know, a lot of Burning Man folks there with, with things that, you you know, you, you wouldn't see unless you got to the desert. So I, I think it reflected the Bay Area creative culture in a, in a really great way. And that's one of the things I was proud of. But, you know, the Bay Area, in addition to having that creative culture, also has a commercial culture. And, you know, people work at a Google during the day and they do Burning Man at night. You know, it, it's the complexity of it. But some people want just one side of that, just the creative side and not the commercial side. And I get that. I have more questions for Dale, but first I have to let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Bitwarden. What is the easiest way for businesses and individuals to store, share, and sync sensitive data? Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work. One of the biggest challenges for business is to empower employees to follow password management best practices. By giving your employees Bitwarden, they can securely store credentials spanning across personal and business worlds. Every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of a personal vault, which allows the user to store their own personal credentials. Use Bitwarden for your business. When an individual joins a team or a company, they can be assigned to the organizational vault for access to shared credentials. Quicker access means quicker productivity. Also, Bitwarden is fully customizable. You can adjust features using enterprise policies to adapt to your business needs. Bitwarden also just released a few new features, including Bitwarden Send, a fully encrypted method to transmit sensitive information, whether text or files, to anyone. Team members can generate unique and secure passwords for every site and ensure passwords are not used more than once. You can minimize the risk of using weak and vulnerable passwords. Customize and set password requirements and administrative policies that will empower employees to practice good password hygiene. You'll get enterprise-grade security. Bitwarden conducts regular third-party security audits and is compliant with major privacy and security standards such as GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, and SOC 2. Unite your existing systems with Bitwarden using SSO authentication, directory services, or powerful APIs, and a fully featured command line interface. Get up and running fast using the Bitwarden Cloud 
or gain complete control with the option to self-host. You'll be able to monitor and manage security vulnerabilities using the Bitwarden Vault Health reports with actionable insights to exposed, reused, weak, or potentially compromised passwords, as well as identify any items in your vault with inactive 2FA. Mitigate the likelihood of successful phishing attacks by storing passwords and other sensitive information with an end-to-end -end encrypted vault. Bitwarden is an open source password manager trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide for secure password storage and sharing. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise trial or a Teams or Enterprise plan at bitwarden.com slash twit or try it for free across devices as an individual user. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. So, so Dale, uh, um, there was kind of a, I don't know what that was, like in 2019, it was, a, it was an advance of the, um, of, of the, of the pandemic, but it was sort of an announcement that make it closed or something, but it really didn't yeah. quite, I think. So well, it, what, what, it, what went it, down there? <laughs> yeah. You know, make, um, when, when I spun maker media out of O'Reilly, uh, I took some investment and so I had a small amount of venture capital in make and, uh, you know, they support it. And, but, you know, after about 10 years, they kind of said, you know, our, our uh, we don't think we're going to make money off of this. We don't really want, we respect the mission. We like what you're doing, but we don't really want to uh, be involved anymore. So um, they closed it down um, and it went through a process, uh, just sort of a legal process that looks like a form of bankruptcy. Um, and... Uh, I was clear to myself anyway that I didn't want Make and Maker Fair to go away or to fall in hands of someone else that might not continue it in the way that I imagined it should. And so um, I acquired the assets of Make and Maker Fair and formed a new company called Make Community in June of uh, 2019. So um, we kind of rose from our ashes, if you will, and and. Um, you know, kept the magazine going, continued to publish books and continued to manage uh, Maker Faire licenses. And, you know, we've been able to be, um, uh, you know, support ourselves uh, doing this and, and, you know, stable as a business and, and move forward. So, um, you know, I, I it was a very painful process. A lot of sort of negative messages go out during these things. But um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad where we are today. I, I mean, considering um, what the pain that was surely involved in that, that was actually kind of a remarkably smooth transition. Yeah. Because everything's still active. It's still a happening yeah. thing. And so the people, quite, you know, the people, you know, we lost a few people. Um, but for the most part, the core team, the magazine, and um, people who worked on Maker Fair were able to kind of sustain that. So, um, you know, I feel, I feel positive about that. But, you know, it is a, you know, businesses succeed and fail for a lot of reasons. And, you know, I could even be blamed for some of them. But, uh, you know, the important thing, they also continue because people want them to to continue. And I still think there's uh, there's, uh, 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 you know, brought, uh, you know, a future for this. And I, I, I want to make sure it it uh, it continues. You know, I. I I was thinking one of the reasons I asked you earlier about when uh, the magazine started was that I wanted to kind of figure out what age my son was, my youngest son, who's uh, now 24, but he was like nine at the time. He took, I mean, I got, I got one of the first magazines. I got the first one and I was a subs subscriber, uh, I think that whole time Thank anyway, um, while, while he was young and um, he had to have it. And he wasn't even like, especially a maker type. I mean, you know, it's, he was a reader more than a maker that we made some stuff, yeah. you know, it, yeah. um, but it was like, he had to have it. And what made me, uh, think about it, um, uh, it is that I, I mean, one of the things I started thinking about it back then, and I think about it the same way today is that 
human beings are makers first, I think, more than anything else. I mean, what do we know about old uh, ancient humans? They made stone tools, right? right? Yes, know they absolutely. Won't. We are yeah. makers. We are making animals and we are unbelievably resourceful as, as creatures. I mean, you, yeah. you want to find resourceful people, look at impoverished communities, right? They're doing yeah, stuff. Absolutely. They have to. They have to. Right. I, I was in, but we, yeah. I think the interesting thing is that we don't always value that. <laughs> you know, yeah. we, it gets lost in consumer culture. Uh, and, you know, we, we almost lose that connection to the past. Like, you know, Bruce Sterling wrote the, of uh, a column in the very first issue of Make on flint napping, you know, and he said there's probably more people making stone tools today than <laughs> ever in history. <laughs> well, but you know, you think about that though; it's passed on from people to people, and I, I kind of also realized that was happening in our age is that it that know-how was also being passed through things like YouTube and the internet at large. That people had access to new to learning new ways of doing things. And acquiring capabilities because of the internet. Uh, in, in the past, they were often limited to the people they knew to teach them these things. And if your mom or dad was a maker kind of person, you learned from them. And if they they weren't, well, you just thought you didn't have that capability, and that never developed in you. So, I, I think the internet has leveled that and made the opportunities available to more people to acquire this know-how. You know, it's funny. My, I am the first, um, the first male with my surname in five generations who is not a carpenter by trade. <laughs> and uh, um, my father was an, even though he did other things, he was a construction worker. He sold insurance and other things. Uh, he helped build the George Washington Bridge. He was, he grew up right there and 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 worked on that with no fear of heights, which I also inherited. By the way, it's a weird thing. Wow. <laughs> but it's a, it's a. Um, uh, I mean, I, I grew up with, you know, with a guy who hammered everything and, and like made the things he needed if he didn't have them already. And and that is just such a human thing. And I, I really feel like there's a, a bit of a tug of war. And, and, and you've been more involved in it than anybody, I think, between on the one hand, what you call consumer culture. You know, we're going to consume what companies make. And... Um, and, you know, there's almost a digestive process where you buy a new one, like, like even a phone, right? you get rid of the phone if it's three years old, he's not going to do the stuff you need now. And, um, and you're going to consume it, you're going to dump it, even though it's an extension of yourself and you have tools on it, yeah. your software yeah. tools, but, yeah. but, but there's this other force that's a really human force that is, I'm, you know, I'm participating in this world as an individual who is going to socialize what I learn and 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 have other people use it because it's helpful. And I think there these are these are in a constant conflict. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And it's kind of what I think when Aaron talked about creativity, it's it's like you have your own ideas, your own insights, and you want to act on them. You don't just want to say take take what other people give you, and that's good enough. Um, and I think it really goes for me back to the hacks thing when people found they could modify software easily or create a new interface. They they did it. Um, it was just human to do that. And that's why I kind of feel like, well, make is this sort of happy face of a good side of human nature and lots of hope. It's also subversive today because it's encouraging people to do something that a lot of people really don't choose to do that. They, they just and, and where I think particularly I care about this for young people is, you know, do you want a future that is created by, you know, a few large companies, especially in terms of technology and can, and power and, and everything is controlled by those companies, or do you want something that's more open and accessible and transparent and uh, you're able to participate in creating that future and being a part of it? Um, I think it's either going to be imposed on us or we are going to, you know, gain more control ourselves and, and try to create it uh, together. Yeah, in the in the uh, speed of innovation slows down when that happens, as we all know. Yes, from the From the open source side of things, you know, if you've got a closed source project, 
uh, you know, some, some proprietary software, it, it, things slow down. You, you, you can't suggest, yeah. you can't suggest improvements. You don't know what the code is. And so it's, it, it really does tie together with the open source movement. I, I want to uh, uh, double down just for a second on the creative aspect that you were just talking about, because we, uh, I want to bring in some questions from the audience as well. And uh, David on Discord asks, the, uh, he says, I would be interested in the perspective on steampunk, I know it's mostly alt history fun, but they have a very active maker community around this idea of humans being makers first and not losing that. And so I wanted to bring that in because I feel like that's a really good example where you where you have this combination of people making things, but they're doing it with an incredible creative element as well. Yes. And community element. I think this yes. is yeah. what I find great about steampunk as a, a well-identified community uh, that um, – uh, you know, and, and again, I think what's hard for some people to get their head around, especially more the engineering type is, you know, they, who tend to look at the usefulness of something. You know, a lot of what steampunk is made is is more cosplay in, in a sense. It's more uh, something you wear. So, uh, but what, what I realize about, about that is – Wearing those things allows you to connect to other people, right? To form a tribe and to have a conversation and to enjoy each other. And you're in, right? Because you made something and, and you know, you maybe show others how to make that. And that, that sort of sense of association, I think, is really powerful. And, and for a lot of people, some of the bad things, I think, in our culture, it, 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 you know, are happening because people don't belong somewhere, they, they don't have a thing that is their creative outlet, uh, is, is a place for them to direct their energy and, and is positive and, and gives them, you know, back something that's, that makes them better people. Yeah. So I heard you say uh, uh, place and uh, outlet. And so that brings me to my next question, which is makerspaces or hackerspaces themselves. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, how important is a place to go do this in terms of uh, uh, of this community aspect and everything that's going on. And also, you know, I guess that also brings up the question is hackerspaces seem to be, you know, they'll, they'll go like gangbusters for a while and then all of a sudden like they kind of go away now taking us, taking aside the COVID stuff, right? Cause we know that yeah. COVID has definitely had an impact, but I mean, why is that? How important is that? And, and why do, why do they kind of come and go? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a little bit like, like I was talking about businesses that come and go sometimes because of, you know, uh, a board of directors or a employee uh, or, or, or something, you know. I mean, there are different patterns in this, and I probably won't go into all of them, but some some hackerspaces were more like clubs, you know, like eight people got together and they wanted to have a space. And, you know, then their lives change and one person drops out and they don't have a, a way to replace them and – you know, that just loses energy after a while. Um, others, I always uh, used Artisan's Asylum in Somerville, Massachusetts as a model maker space, yeah. uh, you know, that not only had really great founders, but they they passed it on to other people. And and I think when, when I look at a maker space, I kind of look, is this the effort of one person, you know, just heroically creating the maker space for other people? Or is it really a group of people working together that have a mission for doing this? And, and I, I think, uh, uh, you know, same happens in educational maker space where a heroic teacher creates it, but that teacher moves on to another school and the maker space, you know, goes apart. So you have to build some kind of, uh, um, cooperative vision of that makerspace that other people can join and hold on to and, and sustain. Uh, one of the things that I was kind of interested in during the COVID is that there's, there's a vision of makerspaces, I think, originally that, you know, individuals come and they do their work there. Um, and they're, they're there largely for their own project. And that's fine. I'm not criticizing that. But I also saw during Plan C where makerspaces – came together and said, you know, we can't do everything and we can't do it if we all work independently. We have to work together on some things. So if it's face shields, let's put a process together and team together and build face shields. And so I think maker, maker spaces in the future, if they learn from that, I think they're going to be more intentional that they have sort of projects that the space coordinates, which could be an education program, which could be other things, but they're not just focused on serving members like a 
you know, a, a, a gym would be, uh, they, they have to also bring those members together to create something or do something that's meaningful to the group and, and to the community at large. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. The other thing that I would add to that, since the question came up, is uh, being able to cultivate a, a support network yeah. is one of the biggest things that I have found in creating a makerspace. Yeah. It's so important, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, and it's hard. It's a lot it of really work. Is. It's not something yeah. you can't just go out and be like, hey, support the makerspace. It doesn't happen like that. It no. takes a lot of time and effort to develop that support network, but it's hugely important. If you look at some of the... Um, uh, successful. You mentioned Artisans Asylum, which I love. It, we've patterned a lot of stuff that we do at Benicia Maker Space after them. Um, and the one up there where uh, you are, I can't remember the name of it now. Um, uh, I can't remember. But those both have uh, benefactors, right? In order, maybe g giving, uh, maybe somebody has a space that they can donate so that you don't have to pay yeah. rent or, yeah. or or reduce rent because they, agree, they, they, they are bought into the mission. Um, yeah. And so yeah. having those types of, and local in, in support as well, we've gotten tremendous support from, we have a local refinery that's chipped in, a local town government has has sponsored our maker fairs in the past. So just having right. that support yeah. benefit is so important. Yeah. And, and, and so like a makerspace that is internally focused, I think is going to fail over time. And yeah. it has to really have strong connections to the community and uh, people have to know what, what it does and they it, it in some ways it isn't just about membership it it has to be broader a uh, broader mission that connects to and, and serves the community in, in a broader way yeah yeah now i know you also have an educational um bent uh and yeah. you have for a yeah. while with various different yeah. uh, programs yeah. and, and efforts with local schools um can we talk a little well, bit about that and and how yeah. the maker movement has impacted uh, more traditional well, education yeah i have to say that if there's a, a legacy to the maker movement that i'm really proud of uh it's that somehow it has found its way into education um it it is not dominated education is not taken over or anything but it's there and i i sometimes didn't really know if it if even that would happen but uh, as i've said many times it's it's kind of come in the side door not the front door and you know it came because a teacher wanted it, it, it you know in my early days i saw teachers coming to maker fair and i would do a survey of them and ask them you know what why is maker fair important and they, they'd say i'm looking for projects creative projects for my kids you know they're bored. They want to do stuff, and and I I think that's the that's the core element of what the maker movement is in education is is you know like this textbook learning and lecturing doesn't work, and especially if you want to get kids into technology or science or anything, um, even carpentry. You know, let them learn by doing, which is an old Dewey phrase, John Dewey. Um, but give them the context like a makerspace where they can do their own projects. And they can, they can develop them and learn from from that. So, I my goal is we're still not there. I, I think the, the the success of making an education has come at a grassroots level, but not at sort of an administrative level or a state level. Uh, so that there's still a lot to do there. But uh, there there are teachers who have figured out that this is something that works for their kids, and they want to make it happen. And sometimes they dip into their own pocket to make it happen. And that's just not, that just shouldn't happen. And obviously it happens in private schools more easily than in public schools. And that's not right. Um, some, some signs though, you know, I was, I did an interview in my podcast with a gentleman um, that is uh, funding, you know, he had success in business and he's funding um, a, a large um, four-story building at in Rochester, New York, uh, at the uh, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, that is uh, a makerspace essentially, and uh, and so we, you know we've begun to see multi-million-dollar makerspaces being put on college campuses in the country, and I hope that says something to the rest of, uh, of uh, uh, the country and, and elsewhere that they're they're valued and important. Um, and it, what's kind of interesting, too, is that making is is interdisciplinary. It's not just STEM. It's also art and design and craft and other other areas. So it's a chance to bring people of different skills. Uh, 
North Carolina, University of North Carolina had um, multiple maker spaces and started putting them in uh, dorm buildings. And uh, the, the people in charge at the university started to support it because they saw how it was bringing together students from different backgrounds and disciplines to work together on, on projects sometimes of their own making. You know, this is a topic is it's close to home for me because I was a uh, I was a terrible student, but I was a good learner. <laughs> you yes. know, I just I didn't think, get along. I think that's I didn't get along I think with that's a great, school. Yeah, that's that's um, you know that <laughs> that that I I really you know I always say like the maker movement is designed for the C student, you know, who's probably still <laughs> smart, but you know, and is smart, yeah. but they're just bored. You know, they just don't want to yeah. learn. They don't want to check the boxes that. You know the compliance students do. They, they, they want to blaze a trail. They want to do something, and so it's to me that's uh, that's an exciting opportunity. And if schools could just realize, you know, let's not worry about getting you know your top ten percent of students into Ivy League colleges. Let's worry about the bulk of students in in your student body who are bored. They don't know what they're going to do with their lives. They're not good learners. Let's just make them good learners and encourage them yeah. because there's many paths available to them. Just like, you know, like your, your advertisers here, there's, there's different paths than going to a four year college and spending hundred thousand dollars, you know, a year for, for that education. Um, most, you know, this goes back to my O'Reilly days. Most of the people that I, this kind of has driven me into DIY is that a lot of the early programmers that were building the internet, building those companies, they were self-taught, you know, yeah. and, and when yeah. they needed help, they found a book, they found a friend, you know, they said, I can figure this out. They had the confidence that they could master anything there. They, they couldn't have gone to college to take a course in early days in Java because it just wasn't in the university then. But they could pick up a book and, and, and say, yeah, I can do that. It, it's uh, it's interesting when uh, we used to when Linux Journal was operative, <laughs> and I would be speaking to a group of geeks somewhere. You know, it might even be like you know, I mean, uh, yeah. even students. said I'd ask how many people here, especially Linux hackers, like like kernel hackers, the alpha alpha dogs that are. How many of you here are doing what you learned in school? And the answer was like none. <laughs> you know? yes, they were exactly. all self taught. They all learn exactly. from each other, you know, or yeah. from themselves. You know, it's, it's, um, and, 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 you know, if, if I think about COVID, you know, like, you know, it could have been, and it probably still is, uh, 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 an opportunity for students to realize that they can direct their own learning. They can decide what to do. And schools should be a lot more accommodating of that, right? Uh, and help them and support them in that. But there's so many good choices online. You know, like if, if you were to take a computer science class at high school and have a boring high school teacher who doesn't know much about computer science, why not substitute an online course where you have, you know, a really knowledgeable person and, you know, challenging curriculum uh, and, and say, I'm going to do that instead and I'll do that in the evening. You know, if, if we could view school as increasing the optionality of students to, to, to find uh, things that support where they want to go and what they want to do, I, I think, you know, we we change fundamentally our school system from being kind of a monopoly to being, you know, a buffet of lots of different choices. I think that's inevitable. Um, yeah. I, so we are actually like just about out of time. So oh. um I, 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 this is, there's so much more we could talk about and we will have to have you back. I said it to everybody, but it's, <laughs> oh my God, there's so much. Um, so we, we always, we always end, end us with a couple of, of, of questions. We'll skip the one, which is, is there one we haven't asked because we will go over time, but we'll go with the other three. First is, do you have anything to say at all about blockchain? That's kind of a control question for us. We're just asking. <laughs> well, you know, I go in and out of it, you know, and, and certainly there's some, Interesting. Again, I, I've always thought of blockchain as, as fascinating, just in the education space and, and things for um, uh, keeping track of non-financial information, like a transcript or um, uh, credentials. Um, and uh, so as a ledger for those kind of things that ought to be available and open and not needing to go through an, ac an institution to acquire. So, um you know, I, I tend not to think of it in the financial Bitcoin sense, but just sort of in terms of the technology in the back end. 
That's one of our best answers, I think. Um, uh, and finally, what are your favorite text editor and scripting language? Well, I have to say VI is what I learned about and I, <laughs> you know, edited books and I, you know, it's, I think it's just human nature when you, the first thing you learn, you kind of stick with and Emacs and all these other things. There's a lot of now app tools and they're, they're, they're you know, similar uh, and probably better. They color code this and that, but v, VI was, you know, just learning the Linux, the Unix command line in the, in the uh, mid '80s, was uh, was very powerful. I always say two things I learned in school. What that was really valuable. One was typing. <laughs> you, you know, you know, like it was a boring class, but you learned to type, right? And that was, you know, you think about as a writer, as uh, anything you were doing today, being able to use a keyboard was just such an essential tool. So, and then you know, then having later on, you know, I'm self-taught in computing. But it was it was logic, you know, like I like read philosophy or literature and stuff. And, you know, people always said you had to be good at math to be good at computers. But it was actually logic that I think, you know, you need to be good at. And and it was wonderful when you got into like writing programs because you could test your logic and it failed or, or it succeeded and you moved on. I got some of the best grades in logic. I got a C in that one. <laughs> when I was in college. <laughs> Kept me from flunking out of college. Well, Dale, it has been absolutely awesome having you on here. Thank you. Thank you again. And, uh, and come back. And, uh, and I, you have your own podcast, too. So it's not like yeah. people will be denied you. It's a happening thing yeah, as well. No, that's great. So, so thanks yeah. a lot. Well, for Thank you so here. much. I appreciate it, Aaron. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Wow. So, uh, Aaron, that was pretty awesome. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like I said, I, I owe Dale and, and all the folks that have been involved over the years a debt of gratitude because it's certainly been inspirational to me for the things that I've done. You know, even even down to writing. Uh, you know, my book <laughs> isn't gonna. It's not gonna work. You have to hold it in front filter. of your chest if you're doing that. Yeah, it's like this. Does that work? Does that work? Yeah, that's how it works. Oh, there we yeah. go. There we go. Yeah, yeah Linux yeah. for makers. Um, you know, which was uh, something I never thought I would do, right? Uh, until I did it. I had no, I'm not, I'm not an author. I'm not good at writing. Um, but I was inspired to do it because of all of the great things that have happened in the in the maker community over the past 10 years or, or, or more. Um, so yeah, we could have gone on for, I feel like we could have gone on yeah. for another hour at least. Yeah, at least uh, we could go on forever. And now we're actually more than out of time. So I have to thank, <laughs> I have to thank you and thank Dale and thank everybody out there in the cybersphere. This has been another Floss Weekly. We will see you again a week from today. Thanks very much. Hey, if you like tech news, but you also like hearing about it from the people who are actually writing the stories, well, I've got a show for you. It's called Tech News Weekly, and it's me, Jason Howell, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent. Every week, we invite the people making and breaking the biggest tech news stories from around the web onto this show uh, to talk to us about it. It's a lot of fun. You should check it out. Tech News Weekly can be found at twit.tv slash TNW every Thursday. We'll see you there. <laughs>